All right, so if you don't mind just introducing yourself, saying your name, age, and then... You don't want to know how old I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then just what, what your title was at the time. My name is Kenny Massey, uh, lifelong resident of Eudora. Uh, at the time of the Lumberyard Fire, I was one of three policemen in Eudora. And I was working the night of the fire. Okay, so what, uh, when you heard the call, what, what did you do? Did you obviously go to the Just fire? respond to the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Benny said, when, when I got there, and I, I was essentially the first one there because I was working that night, uh, it, the building itself, the main lumber building, which runs east and west for basically a city block, uh, was fully engulfed. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was, uh, it was basically on its way to being gone at that time. So, what were your thoughts when you first saw the fire? <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't say what I <laughs> thought, but <laughs> for for school purposes. But it was, I, I mean, it was just. Uh, let let me back up a minute because okay. it. It was traumatic for me in, in one sense because I worked there all the way through high school. Uh, I drove delivery trucks hauling lumber, as Benny described, uh, to the, the locations where they were building the houses. Then there were times we'd haul two or three boards to somebody here in Eudora that couldn't, didn't have the means to come pick them up. Uh, and then towards the end of my tenure with the lumber yard, I worked full time, uh, and I worked in the office with uh, Bob Day and uh, Larry Scott, who had worked there forever. Uh, so I, I, I was lucky to learn the business of lumber uh, from them, and then the two owners, Harold Keeker and John Harris. Uh, kind of took me under their wing and taught me the ropes of, of the lumber business. So it was a it, it, it was a shock to me to see it burn mm -hmm. because of that and what it meant to the community as Benny described. So So I guess what I was going with that is were you like when you saw that were you in like I guess policeman mode or like yourself oh, like, oh my goodness or I need to A little bit of both. I okay. mean in a fire like that, there's not much, not anything I can do other than to make sure people are, are away. And you have to understand, there was a whole row of houses right on the west side of uh, the lumber yard. Uh, the township building was there, then there's several houses to the south. So one of the things that I remember doing is, is trying to make sure that the people in the houses were out in a way uh, because it was pretty obvious that this had the potential to spread. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you didn't really help at all, fight the fire, just make sure people. Yeah, I'd rather get shot than burned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess since you're more of a policeman, and you might know this. Uh, do you who were the suspects? Are you allowed to share? Well, we kind of jumped way ahead there, but okay, yeah, uh, sorry. You, you have to understand before any suspects were or were not developed, there was a lot of work that went into even to determine that it was an arson fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree with mm -hmm. Benny that you didn't have to be Dick Tracy to figure out that something happened here because of the way it burned and and how fast. So once, once the fire was out, which if I remember correctly, Benny was a while with all the smoldering and all the lumber that was in there, uh, you have to, we had to treat it as a crime scene, okay? Which means we had to get a search warrant to, to go in and do the investigation. Then we had to bring in uh, I, I think the state fire marshal came in, but okay. we, end up, we, we ended up going more with a group of independent 
arson investigators, a guy by the name of Larry Stimmerman, Stimmerman yeah. who was a retired Lawrence firefighter, who was probably one of the best arson investigators in this part of the state. He's now dead, if I remember correctly. Uh, he and uh, another guy came in. I think his name was Leo Souders, who was probably retired now also. But anyway, they, they are the ones that dug through the debris and determined that it was set. Mm -hmm. And what they came up with was that the fire started on the east end of the building in two trucks. Someone had poured accelerant on and in two of the trucks at the east end of the building and set them on fire. Uh, now you have to understand, and, and Benny will concur with this, that building was not secure in any way, fashion, or form when it came to security. Now the office door was secure, but the two big doors at the east end of the alleyway they kind of flopped in the breeze, and it, it would not have taken a lot of work to get into those. It, just, it was just the nature of the old building. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so once it was determined that it was arson, uh, I don't know. There, there were tips coming in like crazy, and you have to understand back then, law enforcement is not what it is today. Okay, it, it was just a different world. The technology wasn't there and, and all that. So there, there were suspects developed, uh, one of which started to take a polygraph, got up in the middle of it and walked out uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I have since run into that person and knowing that the statute of limitations has well run, which is five years, uh, I, I just flat asked this person, come on, tell me, did you set the fire or not? And he vehemently denies setting it, which I believe, mm -hmm. because I think, I, I think he, in my opinion, was just entered into it as he was entered into the situation as a suspect by people who had something out for him, okay, that, mm -hmm. that would like to see him get jammed up for. Yeah. Uh, so, other than that, I, I, I can honestly tell you that we never developed any relevant suspects, okay? And I heard you ask Benny if he had any idea maybe why it was set on fire. Uh, to this day, I have no idea. I, I worked for the owners for several years, two of the most stand-up, hard-working guys you, you'd ever want to know. Uh, loved the lumber business, loved having the lumber yard in Eudora and all the services it provided. Employed a lot of people from Eudora over the years. Uh, they were financially sound, they were financially fit, uh, so <laughs> motive, who the hell knows, yeah. to be quite honest with you. Yeah. So, so it's just that one guy that, and you don't, you don't even think that he did it? No, I really don't. So I guess, I, I did some, a little bit of research, uh, do you think it could have been insurance fraud? No. They were financially okay. fit. So it definitely wasn't? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and the insurance, I mean, the insurance company, if I remember, even sent in some investigators. To make sure. Know, and yeah. Not only to look at the fire, but at the financial standing of the company. Mm -hmm. so, and no. one, one thing I forgot to ask going back how long did the fire last? Yeah, it burned forever. I mean, you gotta, and Benny's, Benny's the fireman, but I know enough about fire that. A fire will burn as long as there's fuel there, and, mm -hmm. and Benny can relate to this. I mean, most people did not realize the amount of lumber that was kept in that large hallway. Mm -hmm. of did, where did the you have a number or a way to measure it? 
No, other than I worked there and moved lumber in and out of it for years, it, it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. Um, that's really all I have. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, other than the fact that that, that fire, and I've lost track of John Harris. Harold Keeper died several years ago. Uh, and John, the last time I saw him was at a funeral because he worked for Warren McElwain. I don't even know how John's health is now, but other than the fact that I, I've always, when I had the opportunity, I, I always expressed to John that this is a, probably the one case out of my career that still kind of haunts me, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, just, just because of the financial loss, the loss to the city and uh, the community, and it, it, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and I'm sure it also, like you said, you worked there, so it had to yeah. emotionally yeah. impact you. Yeah, yeah, you, and, and Benny will tell you this, and if you've done research into arson fires, arson is probably the toughest criminal act that there is to solve, and on top of that, it is the most troublesome criminal case to ever get a conviction on, just because of the nature of the beast. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you got to be pretty damn dumb to get convicted of arson <laughs> in a criminal court. I mean, you got to not really know what you're doing. Uh, but there, there was no doubt that fire was set. I mean, once those arson guys got in there and started showing everyone the poor patterns uh, on the trucks, and especially, remind me, Benny, that floor was asphalt, if I remember correctly, instead of concrete. Yeah, and, and you, Yeah, and you yeah. could actually see the poor patterns in the asphalt where, I'm mm -hmm. assuming the gas, the accelerant, ran down and burned, yeah. basically pits in the floor. Uh, yeah, and then the depot was, as Benny described, in, in my opinion, as tragic a loss as the lumber yard was from a uh, historical building point of view because I know even back then the conversation always was of everything that that depot could be turned into in the future, yeah. you know, uh, something relevant for the community and it went up in flames. So, and, and I don't remember, Benny, this is more down your line, uh, I, I don't remember any firefighters or anybody getting injured out of the situation. Getting into it? Injured. Oh, injured, no injuries, that surprised yeah. me. Yeah, which if, considering where firefighting was at that time as compared to now, uh, and the technology and, you know, uh, it, it, to me it's amazing somebody didn't get hurt or killed mm -hmm. and trying, trying to mess with that fire. You, so you said that there were three other Eudora policemen. Uh, were any of them there with you? No, nah, the one guy back then, uh, he never showed up, I don't think. And I think Bill Long, who was the chief at the time, he eventually showed up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the, and, and I don't know, there may have been some sheriff's office guys that showed up, but they were there for nothing more than traffic control and yeah. all that. So, yeah. All right. Well, yeah. thank you. Pretty basic. Yeah. How long did the investigation last? Oh, man, it went on. It seemed like forever. <laughs> yeah. Forever. You know, months, months. Uh, yeah, it was frustrating. You'd think you'd get going somewhere and then... It, it, the information would just go away, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, it went on for a long time. I, I mean, if you think about it, Benny can relate to this. I mean, those guys, those arson guys, and, and we helped with it. I mean, you got to shovel through that stuff, you know, shovel full of time and, and dig stuff out. And I, I'm sure they did some sifting of stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know, but it, it's very, very labor intensive. So yeah. That's why I never wanted to be an arson investigator. <laughs> too, too much, too much. So, crazy thing.
is one of the biggest things that ever happened in New York during my tenure here, other than the double murder or the murder down behind the bank that time, yeah. you know. So, yeah. Do you have any more questions, please? No, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Yeah. So, so what piqued your interest in this? I'm curious. Um, I was just I was looking for a topic and I reached out to Ben. Hey, are there any unsolved cases in Eudora? And he was like, Yeah, actually, this one. And so I was like. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. Yeah. You, you know, John Harris would be a great one to talk to, but I just don't know what John's health is. I don't right know what now. his health is, but what was it? Then several years ago, he provided. Yeah, I uh, met him. A but, lot of items. Yeah, for, it was uh, about six years ago. Yeah. The, yeah. You never like meet a nicer guy the wall. than John Harris. So yeah. you know, I mean, if you want to take this. From, down to the victim level, boy, mm -hmm. he'd be one to talk to. Right. He's, you, you never meet a nicer guy than yeah. John Harris. So, now, Harold was a little cranky sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Harold's all right, but uh, yeah. he, and, had, he had a stress factor, I think. Oh, that, yeah, he chewed my ass more than once. Yeah, I tipped a lumber truck yeah. over one time. Because he always said, I want the lumber where the customer wants it. <laughs> So it was over north at a guy's house called Don Sheriff. He just died recently, just north of the UP tracks. And we had to back these lumber trucks with lumber above the headboard. We had to back up and around to the back of the foundation. And Albert and Larry Wirtz were building the house. I said, Albert, I can't get this up here. Well, that's where we want it. <laughs> Customer's always right. <laughs> I'm backing up there and it was slick and I slid over a little bit and that backfill for the foundation gave way. The truck ended up on the side. That was not a phone call to Harold Keeker I wanted to make. No. <laughs> You're doing what he wanted you to do. Yeah, yeah. He didn't fire me, so I was all right. Yeah. Bill Long, I, you know, you could interview him, but yeah, they called me out of bed and I went yeah. down directly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you try to go item by item, like say, the first year I called in was the township. Sure. Well, Jerry Nice saved us a lot of work. He stayed up there in the intersection and directed trucks soon yeah. to come in. Yeah. When they called in the city of Lawrence, he sent them down to the big yeah. hydrants. Uh, stuff like that, you know, that goes on behind the scenes yeah. that, uh, you know, you you find out later and appreciate them. Because, mm -hmm. uh, one man can't make those decisions. Well, I think Benny would concur with what I'm about to say yeah. is anybody that was there after that fire got going, it, it, it was not a save the building fire, it was just try to save the surrounding areas yes. because well, I, I mean you have to I mean there was a well the house is still there, that, that big house just on the east, just to the east across the alley from the lumber yard where Katzmeyers used to yeah. live. You know, that that was threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one where the flower just wilted in the window yeah. on the inside. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know those little things, you know you just keep moving on yeah. at the time. Uh, I know when the investi I called the dispatcher to get the proper people in line, uh, which was uh, at that time Fire Chief McSwain out of Lawrence. And a little item you think of later, uh, I was we had a rehab set up up there in about uh, Kazmaier's yard. And I called a dispatch earlier and said we need water. Well, she went blank. I mean, I had to rephrase, drinking water. <laughs> and for somewhere, I don't know where they found this stuff. I think they went and raided the grocery store. Yeah. But Gator Aid showed up, yeah. T showed up. And like I said, I was in that rehab up there. And I told McSwain, I says, don't sit down here. And he said, oh, well, I can see the fire here, all right. 
and they made him drink orange juice because they thought he kind of rehab. You know, <laughs> little things like that. And uh, you know, you uh, and I, I had trouble keeping the firemen in rehab because as soon as they got a little water, orange juice, or water, what a Gatorade, they were willing to go back in. Yeah. They, they just, I know they were tired. Well, I appreciate your interest in yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad uh, you guys could come out. So. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't tell you a lot. No, it's yeah. all right. You know. yeah, me either. <laughs> the outcome and, was never what anybody wanted. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. You know. And when do we get our paycheck for <laughs> <laughs> So, So what are your plans with this? Um, have you, I, it's on YouTube, there's BuzzFeed Unsolved videos. Have you seen those at all? They, they find unsolved crimes and they kind of talk through it and then, you know, list the suspects and what could have happened and then they kind of let the viewer decide. So I'm going to try and do that for my, my history class. Yeah. Hopefully I get an A. Yeah. Who's your team? Uh, Jason Tharp. You know him? There's these little things that, uh, like you say, when they start investigating, and I can't remember the first guy you mentioned, and I know him all my life. Zimmerman. The, the investigator. Larry. Larry. Zimmerman. Yeah. Larry Zimmerman. They started on a fi uh, fire investigation in the East End, but they, like you said, they had to sift through everything. Mm -hmm. They started in the saw room, which mm -hmm. was a small room adjoining uh, the alleyway there and the first thing they seen was there was a saw blade broke off or a tooth out of the saw blade and things like that then they went out the doorway into the hallway and found a fire extinguisher that had been overheated and blowed back into the saw room so they know that wasn't where the fire started mm -hmm. because uh, but now, but now those trucks were parked. Yeah, right next to them. Directly to the north of the entrance into that saw room yeah. mm -hmm. is, yeah. is where the floor floor was. Yeah. So you know, those little things you know you you take in stride and keep going yeah. and that type of stuff. And the state when he come in, he wanted to know if all the gates were locked, all the chains were, and they were because we had our men. We cut the chain lock off. Mm -hmm. But I think. Like you said, anywhere in the whole building, you could have walked through it because the building was built for the turn of the century and through wear and tear and weather, it uh, has these loopholes. Right. Yeah, it was not secure. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, those things, at the time, we take and just keep walking. Yeah, it was a mess. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I'm Benny Dean, former fire chief, and uh, at the time I should have been retired, but uh, they wouldn't let me. But that's their material. Uh, right now I'm 83 year old, and uh, of course I still have memories of it foggy memories, but still in there. So, uh, do we go from there? I mean, what else you need to know? Yeah. Uh, so, at the time, do you want to just kind of tell the timeline of the fire? Like, when was it? What did you do the night before? Well, the alarm come in about 3.15 in the morning. And, of course, then you, you go from there. I live approximately uh, two blocks on the other side of what would have been in the highway, 10th Street. I live on 12th Street on the same street as the lumber yards on going north and south. And when I went out the door, the uh, whole north end of town looked like the burning. And it probably should have been, but uh, and I started a procedure then of calling other other departments because I could realize then that 
even before I got there, that we needed extra help. Uh, and my first response was Eudora Township, which is here too. And as I got to the fire scene, uh, I started calling, asking the dispatcher to call other departments because you could tell it was going to be one large fire. So we went from there. Uh, I don't know what else you need to know or start with. It was a huge fire. Yeah. Uh, probably one third of the building was already burnt. Okay. When you first arrived? When you first arrived. We had a deluge down there. He, uh, we sat down in the <coughs> neighbor's yard to put uh, water on the fire. And uh, at that house we set up in the yard, the fire, assuming was arson, had been so hot that it burnt the telephone wires off the house. And it had scorched a flower in the window of that side of the house that didn't hurt the house or set it on fire even. Uh, but the flower in the window had wilted because that hot. Uh, so I guess I'll take you back a little bit. When you first when you first arrived on the scene, what were, like what were your first thoughts when you saw this huge flame? Go on vacation. <laughs> it uh, as your training kicks in, and as I say, you start you know calling other companies in, proceeding to go with you know what it has to be. I'm here, so, I have to get caught. <laughs> That's all right. So we go according to Good morning. Nice. I can see it right there. This is Parker. He's interviewing Benny. Hey, good morning. And then I'll probably have some questions for you. Yeah. We had placement of trucks. Mm -hmm. There's now who's coming, who's already here. And <coughs> those things are flying through your mind. Or at least mine. Mm -hmm. uh, here, you just start your fire procedures as you can see needed. And we went from there. So I, I watched your interview from 2014. Uh, you said that the books hadn't trained you for anything like this. The, the books and the manuals, they, they didn't train you for something this big, did they? Not me. Not you. It, it was in there. Uh, we pre planned that building several times. But it didn't burn the way we had it pre planned. I don't know why it did. But, uh, I can tell you why. Because <laughs> yeah. it was set. Yeah. Yeah. I gonna say it. Uh, sorry, I didn't know. Sorry. No matter what your plans are, they, uh, they never seem to correspond with the buyer. But uh, we, it was uh, different things led to different decisions of a fire scene or anything scene, I guess. The fuel tank that he used for his equipment. Uh, I was decently away from the building, but it had, uh, I call it, rolled tar paper stacked around it for storage. And it got burnt so hot it blew up, and when it did, it scattered the fire scene into everywhere. And about that same time, radiant heat set the train depot we fire. And another company arrived about the same time that was. And of course they were dispatched over to the uh, I guess what we call it. It wasn't used. It was a Santa Fe depot but not used for a depot. It was storage that uh, evidently the lumberyard had rented for storage. And uh, they uh, 
procedure to take care of that. So, like I say, as things progress, you move people around, dispatch them here and there. The, as one of the first trucks that arrived on the scene, there were fire hydrant on that corner, and it was so hot we couldn't touch it. So we moved the truck back a block. Well, I had to bring that truck up as if we got further into the fire scene. And then we had to dispatch a truck around the railroad tracks and where the depot was to protect the city buildings that are there. The city uh, maintenance yard is on the opposite side of the tracks. And uh, so those are things you, you know, as they arrive, you have to address them. So, uh, and there's a loss to the community to lose that building. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was, like I say, so far, I won't say going to start with, but so far ahead of us, uh, we went into a defensive mode and made sure that adjoining houses uh, 100 feet away didn't catch on fire and burn. Yeah. Um, did you did you know the owners of the uh, lumber yard? Oh yes, in a small community, uh -huh. uh, you're pretty well acquainted with everybody. Were that? Did Did you like them? Did, Pardon? Did you like them? Were, were you friends well, with them? Yes, I, oh, I, okay. I had no reason not to. Good. good. Uh, so you you seem pretty convinced it was arson. Is that yeah, you I, I could almost say that as I arrived on the scene. Any time after midnight, and you have a huge building on fire, and I'd say, like I say, at least a third of it was already burned, uh, you could just about say arson without even looking. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes about a half hour to 45 minutes to burn a shoe before it, too. And when over, like I say, a 30 building with rafters and a stored lumber burn. Uh, it was burning for a while. Somebody had to set that probably in a uh, guesstimated uh, 11, 12 o'clock because it, we didn't get the call till 3.15, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So it had that been about the right burn time, roughly. Yeah. So why why do you think people, someone would have set it on fire? Oh, I have it? no idea. Yes. I'm just there to put it out. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I uh, met the, in the first meeting of the group that uh, was going to do the investigating, and after that I left it up to them. Yeah. I mean, that's, I've had training in it, but to that large of fire and what burnt, uh, it was above my field. Mm -hmm. um, and then my last question is, kind of difficult to answer is what economic results came out of the fire like obviously it impacted the lumber yard owners negatively well, it was one of the major build, buildings in town that done a, a lot of local business also uh, the trucks that were already loaded with lumber didn't help us in hand when it was burning uh, had at least maybe a house, complete house lumber, uh, ready to go out that next morning. And uh, that was one way that they made their business was selling or bidding lumber for a house. And then one of the guys was an architect, I'd call him, to draw up plans for houses. So it was quite a devastating blow to them as the community itself. Because you could save a lot of trips to the neighboring town to buy something. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's all I have for questions. Do you have anything else you want to add on to that? No, it's it's past, it's done, there's not much, you know, what else can you do? Yeah. You might relive it here and there. Yep. Uh, but those are that's the way it goes. I mean that's uh, after. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah.
don't even need to talk to him. Okay, yeah. He has all the energy. All, all I can say is I've seen a fire. Uh-huh, and you, and you helped put it out. You were the first one there, right? Well, yes. <laughs> that didn't mean my glass of Kool-Aid helped any. <laughs> Alright, well thank you if you guys don't yeah. mind swapping places. <clears throat> I, I can honestly stand here and tell you guys that there were never legitimate suspects ever developed, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's and, it, and it's hard to do that when you can't come up with a motive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, they they even well, looked. I hear rumors of motives, but uh, you know, that I mean, we we even looked kind of. into competition. You, you yeah. Know, uh, and even though this lumber yard thrived for years, I mean, it was not a threat to any of the big lumber yards back in the day. And, you know, back then there wasn't Home Depot and all that. Yeah. And so yeah. there wasn't any competitive thing. So. Right. Well, it was a low scale work yeah. operation. Yeah. But and, and, and the funny thing about the lumber yard down here, and, and I just throw this out as conversation. When, when contractors were building houses for other people, they went many times to other lumber yards that sold cheaper lumber. Yeah. Okay? Because Harold and John sold good lumber. Douglas yeah. Fir. Uh, so when these same contractors were building the house for themselves, mm -hmm. they would come buy their lumber from the yeah. door. <laughs> uh, but... He, he, Benny hit the nail on the head. It, it was full service lumber yard because John Harris drew all the plans, uh -huh. did all the drafting and, yeah. and all that, and you know Harold yeah. did the estimating. So. That was one thing that John Harris, who's one of the operator owners, told me later that uh, his drafting room with all the blueprints to come house that are already on a working order. Mm -hmm. uh, was burned up. He said that was where he thinks he you know, had a lot. Yeah. Well, Ben, I appreciate this. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Kenny. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. Um, Good luck with your project. Yeah, thank you. I'm okay. hoping it goes well. Yeah.